Hi, my name is uh, Sergey. Um, I come from, uh, well, I, start, I studied actuarial studies in university, so kind of statistics and everything. I don't know if my it is. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's working, good. yeah? It's good, yeah. All right, and uh, basically, but now I run an organization that we do mandatory training all across Australia, uh, it's mainly safety. And uh, you know, just get my notes, I've got a few. Uh, basically, that deep that the lady was talking about there, that reminds to me a lot uh, normal distribution turned upside down. I mean, like, that's, that's what you would expect, though. You know, you'd expect everyone creative at five years old, etc. You'd come in the classroom. Some people go into, you know, design technology. Some people go heavily into mathematics. You, then you got, like, uh, well, geeks. Then you got bullies, etc. You would expect that in society. I mean, and then that brings me to the question where, I mean, should, do we need to cre teach creativity? And uh, should we? And more importantly, can we? That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the question. Is that is it even possible? And I mean, because we would go against the statistics, in fact, you know. Yes. Let's uh, pick that up, Stephen, and you take the lead and talk about creativity and bullying. And tell me, why would you possibly suggest that students should go to school without shoes on? Surely oh, that's an H&S um, issue. No, I, I mean, the shoeless thing, uh, quick version, is, is really, it's, it's just about keeping it fresh. But it's, it's interesting, across Scandinavia, kids don't learn with their shoes on, and I think something about the signification of, of learning as being a, a family thing, uh, a community thing, rather than an industrial thing. You go into a factory, you have to wear your shoes to protect them in the home. You know, every child, when they go to read, they kick off their shoes, they find comfortable furniture, and they curl up and they read. You come into school, we make them wear uncomfortable shoes and sit with an upright back on a, on a stiff chair. And, and wonder why we've got a reading crisis. You know, it's not, it's not rocket science, uh, all this stuff. But I think there is also, look, there's an interesting hypothesis here, which mm. is that somehow boys store their testosterone in their shoes, because there's, <laughs> there's no doubt when they take their shoes off, they do, they do turn nice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but the shoes was, don't. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's because it's because it's snowy outside largely, and they, so they have to take their boots off. He's got a. Not exactly so. Oh. Ken Friedman, he's a swimmer, but for 20 years I lived in Norway and Sweden. The reason they take their shoes off is most of the floors are pine, and there's a tradition going back a couple of hundred years. When you come inside, snow, summer, fall, doesn't matter when, you take your shoes off, walk on the floor in your socks. Uh, but also, Scandinavia has a tradition going back. 200 years of 99% literacy. This goes back to the Evangelical Lutheran Church and basically the edict that came from the kings in the church that you had to be able to read the Bible because <coughs> Martin Luther said so. This is what accounts for literacy and uh, the floors account for the shoes. I think we do some wonderful things in Scandinavia. Uh, education in Finland is a great example, something similar in Sweden, but the shoes really go across the whole culture, not just no, but you, but, but, but I mean, and every child in England would take their shoes off when they when they go home, and and great swathes of them. If you look at um, particularly the rural <coughs> rural schools here, kids traditionally taught with their shoes off. So it's a it's a cultural thing in a lot of places. But it is about signification, I think, really significantly. And uh, uh, sorry, this is a complete aside. But did you buy that tie in America? <laughs> yes, this tie comes from Bruce Yeah, let me tell you why I know that because. Uh, <laughs> Because, uh, because, because all, all English and Australian ties, the stripes run from, from left to right. And because American tailors make their ties the other way up, the ties run from right to left. So just by looking at the stripe on your tie, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Not funny. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. I can hardly see your face. <laughs> Smooth on it. Um, thank you. Um, towards the back of the room, is there any question up there? Going, 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 gone. I had one over here. Fascinating. Yeah. I think it's. We Hi, take, uh, yeah, James Sanders uh, from Deloitte Digital. I'm a product manager there. Um, I want to pick up something that Stephen uh, mentioned in the pre uh, morning tea session about uh, game theory and how the theory of games could be applied to education because uh, people choose to play games, they do it because it's a good time. There's a very basic theory which you mentioned of basically aim, fire, adjust and repeat. Uh, and in games, because they're generally quite quick, it's easy because you can see what the result of your um, action was, you can work out how to change and then 
repeat and see what the difference res different results are. But yet in education, uh, you have very little opportunity to aim, fire, adjust because you're told to go away, in many cases, independently work on a project and then hand it into your teacher, your lecturer, whoever. And then you'll be marked on it and that's the end of that. But uh, so how can we take the theory of game, which is uh, by choice used by children and adults and apply it to education? Kick off there. Well, yeah, I think this kind of goes back to keeping things fresh too. This is gamification is a kind of a buzzword right now, but um, for me in design thinking, the the this this relates directly to what we would call prototyping or experiments. So if you run a quick prototype or experiment, you want to go back to the user, get some feedback, and then go back and improve it. So on a project base, in my class. Uh, it's required as some of the milestones. You've got to go back, get that feedback, present that, and then go back uh, two or three times. Um, so it's not really a game per se, but it feels like, like the same kind of adjust, shoot, uh, you know, make, make things to it. I think parents sometimes get too worried if, if their kids are playing games at school versus thinking I, they got to get to learning, right? So, um, but uh, it's an enjoyable way to learn. It's, it, it pulls you in versus feeling like uh, I'm sitting there having stuff hit over my head. And some kids respond to that really strong. The, um, you can certainly tell the video game manufacturers have that dialed in completely. Um, so much it may feel addictive to some parents, but everything in moderation, including moderation we were talking about. Um, <laughs> including moderators, you mean? So, um, it, 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 if, um, so some of that exposure I think is really good. The kids learn to navigate, the kids learn to do different things quite quickly and that's useful in other places. There's a, there's a, I mean there's a pretty whopping literature of games-based learning and, and, the, uh, you know, and, and lots, of, lots of good research, all pretty unequivocal really. But I mean the, the, the early days um, people were, were I think, thinking, look you could see Games are engaging. If we could get that level of attention from children in their, you know, learning to tell the time, that would be good. So, because the games were pretty simple, so writing educational games, you know, telling the time games up. As the games got more sophisticated and more complex, you know, Grand Theft Auto sort of scale, um, having the resources in education to write games with a specific learning outcome became quite complex. And so you've seen a lot of people intervening with games to, you know, the machinima stuff in 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 video games where people are you know, acting out scenes of Shakespeare in Grand Theft Auto and so on, which are all heaps of fun, lots of, lots of websites about. Um, but I think what's happened now, rather interesting, is we've gone back to the little sort of app world. And, uh, and you know, suddenly the ability to, you know, to build little ingredients that are themselves playful and challenging, which assemble into a greater whole, is where game playing is gone and um, where learning is gone. So you know, the, the two having sort of parted with expense seem to be coming back together. And the, the, the bit that really excites me at the moment is the, the game stuff that's beyond the screen. I've been doing some work with um, kids where they, with little GPS devices. Their, their task has been to, to walk a picture onto the streets of their town. So they study the map and then they think, okay, I'm going to do a boat. For me, it's going to be a boat. And they, they have to walk the boat onto the streets of their town and then get back and look at the, look at the GPS trace and see how well they did. And you've, you've seen the kids you know, caching and so on. So I, th I think as gaming spills out of the screen, the potential is even, even greater. But it is fundamentally, it's that observe, question, hypothesize, test, loop, you know, that's been so powerful in science. And the disconnect, the kids play it, but they don't realize when they go down to the ecology pond and look and they're making a judgment about predators and prey, that actually the same thing that they were using to decide, uh, you know, how to collect the gold rings, you know, was going to work perfectly well on the pond. And we should have joined that up a little earlier. Well, we mind yes. you do, but <laughs> not often. You know. <laughs> it's a good lesson. Good lesson. I've got something um, quite uh, valuable, I think, to add to this. You will have to stand and turn and talk if you are, Mr. Bubbleman. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come over this way, so I'm not. So you guys can see. Um, so, uh, in my experience, um, after leaving the world of um, 
uh, the science museums and trying to teach science in a, in a science culture, which I actually found incredibly counterproductive because unfortunately science has a culture of um, an addiction to uh, knowing because of the way that um, the so-called ego works. And um, you only find the true humility that you get in the, the scientific greats, um, which is where they have this wonderful opening to unknowings and opening to new things. Um, and so this, it's, it's an egoic result that um, causes uh, a certain drilling down and a deepening in scientific knowledge. Anyway, um, after leaving that world, um, I discovered, I went and studied the tradition of the wise fool and incorporated that in my teaching processes. And this was really, really fascinating because um, it gamified the teacher-student relationship because the tradition of the fool, um, and often they're the social comics and, and um, comedians and hold this role in society. And what um, the way that I applied it was by um, not being the one who bared the knowledge and in, or instead applied my knowledge in the way that I'd ask the questions of the students and sometimes um, and systematically would deliberately get things wrong, right? And when the kids work out that um, you deliberately get things wrong and make a fool of yourself, um, they get to laugh at you so they get a, um, a, a reward at being able to laugh at the teacher. But that has all sorts of like... Um, neurochemical responses and it, um, that when it's systematically done by a teacher you can actually help put kids into flow states of learning consciousness where they're excited, they're fun, they're engaged, they're always looking to catch out the teacher and um, thank you, Andrew. and also they're rewarded and it yeah, seems to work very effectively. Thank you. We'll take that as a comment. This is Tony Jones would say.